Susan came to a Barclays Bank and talks to a bank clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Good morning. What can I do for you? Good morning. I'd like to open a bank account. What kind of account do you want? I'm not quite sure. I'll be a college student. I simply require a safe place to keep my money and easy access to it. Can you recommend an account for me? All right.、Uh, do you get a grant? No, I will be supporting myself. I see. You could open an instant account. What's an instant account? Basically, it's an interest account. It has all the usual current account facilities, such as a cash card and a deposit book, except a cheque book, and pays competitive interest on your account when it's in credit. There are two levels of interest for this account. If your balance is up to five hundred pounds, the interest is five point two five percent. If your balance is five hundred or over, it attracts an even higher rate of interest, which goes up to seven point two five percent. You will receive a cash card for our machines, so you can withdraw money with the card from any machines or any Barclay branches when the bank is closed. Oh, I see. How can I withdraw money if I have no checkbook? Well, you have to withdraw money either using your card or visiting your branch. I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. How can I find out how much money I have in my account? You can ask your branch and tell them how often you would like to receive your statement, which provides you with a permanent record of income and expenditure. It will show every transaction on your account and the balance remaining at the end of each day. You can also use your cash card to check your balance. That's fine. I think I'll open an instant account. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk about the women's conference. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. There will be two meetings held in Beijing, and they will overlap. One, the NGO Non-Governmental Organization Forum on Women, will be held in Beijing from August the thirtieth to September the eighth, nineteen ninety-five. The other one, the Fourth World Conference on Women, FWCW of the United Nations, will be held in Beijing. From September the fourth to the fifteenth, nineteen ninety-five. Why is the UN, United Nations, holding these meetings? 
The UN has noticed that discrimination against women has been increasing. The UN definition of discrimination, any distinction, exclusion or restriction made on the basis of sex, which has the purpose of deciding or not, allowing the full recognition of a woman on the basis of equality between male and female, human rights, freedom in political, economic, social, cultural or other fields. Women are discriminated against in every country of the world. The UN has issued policies to deal with the discrimination. The UN has also placed the improvement of women's status position high on the global agenda. The world is getting smaller. We are becoming a global family that shares problems and difficulties. We can learn from one another, help one another, and share ideas and information. There have been three previous world conferences on women, first in Mexico City in 1975, second in Copenhagen in 1980, and third was in Nairobi in 1985. During the first conference held in Mexico City in 1975, which was during the International Women's Year, one outcome was the declaration by the UN General Assembly for Decade for Women, 1976 to 1985. In Copenhagen in 1980, the participants adopted a program of action for the second half of the UN Decade for Women. The 1985 Nairobi Conference was held at the end of the UN Decade for Women, and the results were published in a book called The Forward-Looking Strategies, which provided a framework for action at the international, national and regional levels of government and groups to promote greater equality and opportunities for women. The slogan for the UN Decade for Women was Equality, Development and Peace. This year, from the end of August until the middle of September, Beijing will hold two conferences. They are separate conferences, but related. The NGO Forum 95, from August the 30th to September the 8th, about 30,000 participants, both women and men, are expected to attend. It will be about women, their lives and their perspectives. This will provide women around the world with an opportunity to discuss and develop ideas, perspectives, plans and strategies and share information to celebrate women's achievement and contributions in society and to draw attention to and develop solutions to the discrimination facing women worldwide. Who can participate in the NGO Forum 95? Any individuals or groups who fill in an application form and send 50 US dollars to NGO Forum, New York, by April 30th, 1995, who will attend the fourth World Conference. Each member state of the UN will send an official delegation. There are 184 member states in the UN. Also, any person that represents an organization which has received accreditation. This had to be done by January 13th, 1995. 6,000 people are expected to attend this conference. There has been over three years of preparations for this conference in Beijing at the international, national and regional levels in all the participating countries. The preparation committee has organized all the issues into 10 categories. The conference in Beijing will discuss all these issues. At the end of the conference, the UN will issue a Platform for Action the Platform for Action will address the following critical areas of concern. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Listen to the following directions and answer questions 15 to 20. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome to this afternoon's tour of the campus. I'll be your guide for the duration. Before we start, could I please ask you to look at your campus map? That's the one you just got when you came in. Because the university buildings are not quite spread out, the tour will be on foot. Now, let's start where we are the main building. As you come out of the main building, you will see two other big buildings opposite you. One is the campus branch of the Midland Bank on your left. The other one is the post office. Then we will follow the Mary's Road until we come to the school lane. Here, on the opposite side of the road, you will see a huge white building directly on your left hand corner. That would be the student's library. The student union is next to it, opposite the bank. Then we turn right and get into Candle Lane. There is a big shopping centre directly on the corner, and the science building is on the left hand side. As we go down Candle Lane, past the shopping centre, we come to the school bookstore, which has a good reputation. All necessary course books can be bought there, not the one next to the shopping centre, but the one after that. On the high street. Opposite the bookstore, there is the sports centre, which takes up the whole block between Mary's Road and Candle Lane on the high street. Finally, we circle back to the main building. The tour will last about an hour and a half. I hope you will enjoy this afternoon's tour. Oh, one more important note from Mr. Smith, your director. Please be back to this main building after the tour. There will be a reception at 5.30 in room 204 on the first floor in the lecture hall. You'll meet your teachers and staff there. All of you are welcome. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear some students discussing an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Fiona, we certainly have a lot of work to do this weekend. Mm. I wish now I hadn't spent so much time on my other assignment. Don't say that. You did really well. 80%. Yes, but this is different. It's not hard, really. It's just all a bit of a rush. We had loads of time to get the other one right, but this one is all a bit pressured. That's what makes me anxious, despite the preparation we've done. You shouldn't worry. What could go wrong? Look, let's look through what we can do to make sure it's OK. Well, the main difficulty that's bothering me is about defining the terms of reference. Mm. It's supposed to be about approaches to social welfare, right? Yes, but we're not expected to give a survey of what that means. That's not the point. We're supposed to be comparing the way welfare is approached in collectivist societies and what you might call capitalist societies. So we can concentrate on just that contrast? Yes. The other thing that bothers me is that I'm not really committed to either view. Well, I have strong opinions of my own, but that's not supposed to colour my judgement. How do you mean? Well, what you write for this is supposed to be unbiased. It specifically says that you shouldn't give a personal view. But Professor Green has a personal view. Yes, but that doesn't mean that we have to agree with him. And I don't think we'll do any better if we do. And how long does it have to be? The maximum is 4,000 words. What? But that's the maximum. We'll probably end up with about three, but at least 2,000 is the minimum. 
Shouldn't be a problem. Hmm. Okay. Now look at questions 25 to 30. Now answer questions 25 to 30. Now, where can we get some information on all this? Well, we could ask Olive over there. Olive, you did this assignment last year, didn't you? Not this one exactly, but something similar. <sighs> the most important thing is to get Professor Green's lectures on the welfare state. Is he good? Oh, very good. Didn't you know he was lecturing? No, no idea. Well, he is. He's at the Beckett Building on Tuesdays. I think he's starting this week, so you'll be able to get the series of six. He deals with the underlying philosophy as well as the economics of it all. It's at 10 a.m. I'd go myself, except that I have too much to do. And what about reading? I've got the reading list here. As usual, it has far more titles and references than we can possibly read in the time. I haven't even got a reading list. Where did you get that from, Mike? I got it at the Welcome Lecture. Oh, I wish I'd gone to that now. What you need above all is his own book called Welfare Economics. All the department know it and follow his approach. Oh, right. Good idea. Perhaps we don't need to go to the lecture if we have his book. No, I really do advise you to go to his lectures as well. Well, what was the full title of his book? Mm, if I remember rightly, it's called simply Welfare Economics by Mike Green. I've got it. Welfare Economics, Glenfield University Press, 2006. Great. Let me just write that down. Anything else you recommend? Uh, there's Edward Jones's book, um, Growing Old in Britain. That's essential reading, but you have to be careful because it's a popular book by a journalist. Well, if it's popular, maybe we'll like it. Who publishes that? That's published by Rutland University Press, in 2005. Oh, well, that's very useful. I think it's Professor Green for us next. Right. The end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by Dr. Miranda James. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of talks we have arranged for the Overseas Students Association this semester. Dr. James has very kindly agreed to speak to us today on the topic of public speaking, and judging from the large numbers of you here, it's clearly a subject of great interest and relevance. Dr. James. Hello. It's good to see so many of you here, and hopefully what I'm going to tell you will be useful to you both here at the university and in your future employment. Many people avoid speaking publicly, by which I mean in front of, say, ten or more people. Not because they lack the ability, but mainly because they lack confidence, which is really only due to lack of practice. 
Today, as a consequence of the influence of television, audiences expect speakers to be relatively brief and to the point, in addition to being well-informed and interesting or entertaining. Probably the most important part of public speaking is what you do beforehand, by which I mean preparation. This includes practical details, such as knowing precisely what your topic is and exactly how long you are expected to talk for. You should also plan the content thoroughly. A good strategy is to write out the content as you intend to say it and then make brief notes, preferably on small cards which you use to talk from. This way you sound more natural. You incorporate pauses while you look at your notes and you can then look at your audience while you are speaking. Never read your speech without looking at the audience. Eye contact is a very important part of communicating with an audience. So deliberately move your head and look around at your audience. Pauses are important, as most people, when they are nervous, tend to rush through their speech. Practice speaking slowly. This gives you more time to pronounce your words correctly. It's always easier for your audience to listen to someone whose speaking is clear and calmly paced, so that they can understand the ideas being explained. And the bigger the group, the more slowly you should speak. Remember to project your voice, speaking clearly to the person furthest away from you. It's a good idea to rehearse and record yourself. Pay attention to your intonation when you listen to yourself. It's even harder if you're speaking in a second language, I would imagine. But there's nothing worse than listening to a flat, monotonous voice. So try to vary your tone and rhythm. This will add meaning to your words. Lastly, Pay attention to both your posture and your gestures. A confident person stands or sits in a small group with their head up, chin out and shoulders back. Try to avoid scratching or fiddling with your hair or beard or pens, jewellery and so on. These movements can distract and irritate your audience yet you may be unaware of them yourself. Another reason for rehearsing, preferably with feedback from a friend, or better still, on video. I hope these few tips will make your experience of speaking in public a little easier. Remember, practice makes perfect. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
You're never gonna make it. You're not good enough. There's a million other people with the same stuff. You really think you're different, man? You must be kidding. Think you're gonna hit it, but you just don't get it. It's impossible. It's not probable. You're irresponsible. Too many obstacles. You gotta stop it, yo. You gotta take it slow. You can't be a pro. Don't waste your time no more. Who the fuck are you to tell me what to do? I don't give a damn if you say you disapprove. I'm gonna make my move. I'm gonna make it soon. And I'll do it cause it's what I wanna fucking do. Cause all these opinions and all these positions, they come in in millions. They block in your vision. But no, you can't listen. That shit is all fiction. Cause you hold the power as long as you're trying to make it. There's no way that you make it And maybe you can fake it But you're never gonna make it Are you just gonna take that? Make them take it all back Don't tell me you believe that Are you just gonna take that?